The new Hand of the King for the Greens, Sir Kristen Cole, wasted no time in proving his worth. It is not for you to plead for support from your lords, like a beggar, he told Aegon. You are the lawful king of Westeros, and those who deny it are traitors. It is past time they learned the price of treason, first to pay that price, for the captive lords languishing in the dungeons under the Red Keep. Men who had once sworn to defend the rights of Princess Rhaenyra and still stubbornly refused to bend the knee to King Aegon. But one by one, they were dragged out into the castle ward where the king's justice awaited them with his axe. Each man was given one final chance to swear his fealty to Aegon. Only Lord Butterwell, Lord Stokeworth and Lord Rosby chose to do so. Lord Hayforth, Lord Merriweather, Lord Hart, Lord Buckler, Lord Caswell and Lady Fell valued their sworn word more than their lives and were beheaded each in turn along with eight landed knights and two score servants of retainers. Their heads were mounted on spikes above the city's gates. King Aegon also desired to avenge the murder of his son and heir, Jaehaerys, by blood and cheese, by means of attack on Dragonstone, descending on the island citadel on Dragonback to seize or slay his half-sister and her bastard sons. It took all of the Green Council to dissuade him. Sir Kristen Cole urged a different course, however. The pretender princess had made use of stealth and treachery to kill Prince Jaehaerys, Cole said. Let them do the same. We will pay the princess back in her own bloody coin, he told the king. The instrument the Lord Commander chose for the king's vengeance was his own sworn brother, Sir Arik Cargill. Sir Arik was intimately familiar with the ancient seat of House Targaryen. Many fishermen still plied the waters of Blackwater Bay. Dragonstone depended on the sea for most of its food. It would be a very simple thing to deliver Cargill to the fishing village under the castle. From there, he could make his own way to the queen. Sir Arik and his brother, Sir Eric, were twins, identical in all respects. Not even their fellow knights of the King's Guard could tell the two apart. Both Mushroom and Septon Eustace assert this. Once clad in white, Sir Eric should be able to move freely around Dragonstone, Sir Criston suggested. Any guard who chanced to encounter him would surely mistake him for his brother. Sir Eric did not undertake this mission happily. Indeed, Septon Eustace tells us the troubled knight visited the Red Keep set on the night he was set to sail to pray for forgiveness from the mother above. As King's Guard sworn to obey the King and his commander, he had no choice in honour but to make his way to Dragonstone, clad in the salt-stained garb of a simple fisherman. The true purpose of Sir Eric's mission still remains a matter of some contention. Grand Maester Munkin tells us that Cargill had been commanded to slay Rhaenyra, putting an end to her rebellion at a single stroke, while Mushroom insists that her sons were the Cargill's prey, that Aegon wished to wash out the blood of his murdered son with that of his bastard nephews, Jake Harris and Joffrey Strong. Sir Eric came ashore without hindrance, donned his armour and white cloak, had no trouble gaining entrance to the castle in the guise of his twin brother. Just as Kristen Cole had planned, deep in the heart of Dragonstone, however, as he was making his way to the royal apartments, the gods brought him face to face with Sir Eric, who knew at once why his brother was there. The singers tell us that Sir Eric said to his brother, I love you, as he unsheathed his blade, and that Sir Eric replied, and I you, as he drew his own. The twins bat our best part of an hour, Grand Maester Munkin says. A clash of steel on steel woke half the castle, but onlookers could only stand by helplessly and watch, as no man there could tell which brother was which. In the end, Sir Eric and Sir Eric dealt each other mortal wounds and died in one another's arms with a tear upon their cheek. Mushroom's account is shorter and altogether more nasty. In this account, the fight lasted only many moments. There was no declarations of brotherly love and each of the twins denounced the other as a traitor. Sir Eric, standing above his twin on the spiral steps, struck the first mortal blow, a savage downward cut that Knight took his brother's sword arm off at the shoulder. But as he collapsed, Sir Eric grasped his slayer's white cloak and pulled him close enough to drive a dagger deep into his belly. Sir Eric was dead before the first guards arrived, but Sir Eric took four days to die, screaming in horrible pain and cursing his traitorous brother. For obvious reasons, Singers and storytellers have shown a marked preference to the tale as told by Monkey, and other scholars make their own determinations to which version is more likely. All the Septon used to say on the matter is that the Cargill twins slew each other, and that's all that we can really say for sure. Back in King's Landing, King Aegon's Marshal of Whisperers, Laris Strong, had drawn up a list of all those lords who gathered on Dragonstone to attend Queen Rhaenyra's coronation and sit on her black council. Lords Caltegar and Valarian had their seats on islands. As Aegon had no strength at sea, they were beyond his reach, for now. The black lords, whose lands were on the mainland, however, enjoyed no such protection. With a hundred knights and five hundred men-at-arms of the royal household, augmented by three times as many hardened cell swords, Sir Criston marched on Rosby and Stokeworth, whose lords had only just repented their allegiance to the queen, commanding them to prove their loyalty, adding their power to his own. 
Cole's larger host advanced upon the walled harbour town of Duskendale, where they took the defenders by surprise. The town was sacked and the ships in the harbour set afire. Lord Darkland beheaded, his household knights and garrison were given the choice between swearing their swords to Aegon or sharing their lord's fate, most choosing the former. Rook's rest was Sir Criston's next objective. For warned of their coming, Lord Staunton closed the gates and defied the attackers. Behind his walls, his lordship could only watch as his fields and woods and villages were burned, his sheep and cattle and small folk put to the sword. When provisions inside the castle began to run low, he dispatched a raven to Dragonstone, pleading for help. The birds arrived as Rhaenyra and her blacks were mourning Sir Eric and debating the proper response to Aegon the Usurper's latest attack. Though shaken by the attempt on her life or the lives of her sons, the Queen was still reluctant to attack King's Landing, says this was because of the horror of kinslaying. Maegor the Cruel had slain his own nephew, Aegon the Uncrowned, and had been cursed thereafter until he bled his life away upon his stolen throne. Septon Eustace claims Rhaenyra had a mother's heart that made her reluctant to risk the lives of her remaining sons. Mushroom alone was present for these councils, however, and the fool insists that Rhaenyra was still so grief-stricken over the death of her son Lucerys that she abstained herself from the war councils, giving over command to the Sea Snake and his wife, Princess Rhaenys. Here, Mushroom's version seems most likely, for we know that nine days after Lord Stoughton's dispatch, his plea for help, the sounds of leathern wings were heard across the sea, and the dragon Maelies appeared above Rook's Rest, the Red Queen, she was called, for the scarlet scales that covered her. The membranes of her wings were pink, her crest, horns and claws bright as copper, and on her back, in steel and copper and armour, flashing in the sun, rode Rhaenys Targaryen, the queen who never was.